Hey everyone, it's Rebecca from Thriving School Psychologist and Notes from the School Psychologist blog, and I'm super excited for this coffee chat. I've got my coffee the size of my head per usual. Um, <laughs> and I'm here with Sarah Ward, who is a speech and language pathologist, and I saw her speak a couple of years back. And um, what I really loved about your work, Sarah, was that it's super practical. Like it's uber practical, and all a lot of the sound bites that you said in that um, thing. Uh, six years ago or whatever, I still use, and some of my fan favorites um, come from Sarah. And so one of the reasons I wanted to have Sarah on the show is because school psychologists are always being charged with um, challenges in executive functioning for students, right? And so we're often charged with assessing and providing interventions for teachers and families and kids. So without further ado, I would love for you to introduce yourself. We're so happy to have you. And um, go ahead, let us know a little bit about you and what you're uh, all about. Sure, thank you. And thank you for having me today. So um, I am the co-director of Cognitive Connections, which is a private practice in Concord, Massachusetts. And my co-director is Kristen Jacobson. She and I have been working together for, I don't know, 25 years. And um, it's really been a lot of fun. We've really put together a program around executive function that we call our 360 thinking program um, that is designed to truly get at neurologically developing kids' executive control skills and not merely compensating for them. And I think that's kind of a bit of a big difference. And I also believe, most importantly, we really want practical strategies. At the end of the day, every teacher doesn't want to know what is executive function. It's more, what can I do in my classrooms? And it's very important to understand, I think, that too, a lot of the strategies are designed for all individuals. We all have to use our executive function skills. So the strategies aren't necessarily for a special education population or um, anything in particular. It's just everyday things that you can do as parents, in your classrooms, as clinicians to truly support students in developing independent executive control. I think that's really critical. I mean, we think of reading skills on a, on a continuum, right? From, you know, oh, some kids just like duck to water, they take very little instruction and they get it. And then there's some kids who need a lot of uh, support. And there's some kids who will always need support. And executive functioning seems to fall in that line too. And I'm constantly seeing, and I was scouring the internet the other day <laughs> for a table of what are typical executive function skills. And I always see like, what are the deficits? What are the deficits? And teachers and parents know what's what's not typical or what's really challenging right. but I have a feeling they have a hard time calibrating their level of worry like is this 10 year old boy or right. you know six year old girl or is this like you know, a, deficit? Truly a deficit yeah so Absolutely. there's that can you speak to that range a little bit and how you kind of disentangle what's normal executive function development and when it kind of goes into coaching and when it goes into sort of the things that would cause that more neurologically that would need a deeper sure. intervention. So I think, um, you know, oftentimes when I lecture, one of my favorite presentations is called Executive Function, A New View, because we really sort of show individuals um, a different sort of view of executive function than they typically think. So a lot of times I'll go into a school and they'll say, well, don't worry, you know, we have an ed plan or we have an executive function curriculum. And it's very typically centered around kids organizing their backpack, recording their homework and turning their homework in. And actually those are more the outcome and the product of the executive skill it's not the executive skill itself mm -hmm. so my favorite example in describing this is that obviously you're here and we're chatting and it's lovely but at the same time that we're mm -hmm. chatting you have a little movie in your head and the movie in your head says okay I'm gonna finish talking with Sarah I need to wrap up this recording then I need to quickly run out I've got to get gas and then I was gonna <laughs> grab lunch and then I'm gonna go get in line early to pick up my daughter because if you don't get in line and you're in the back of the line that'll take forever and then as soon as I get her we're gonna run home get into the dance clothes and I'll drop her off and while she's at dance I'm gonna swing into the grocery store and grab a rotisserie chicken and a salad I mean I don't know whatever it is and you <laughs> You're not this, far off. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you have this entire movie going through your head mm -hmm. so that the minute you leave here, you go right to the gas station. Now, if you didn't do that, then all of a sudden you would end and be like, oh, I'm going to take care of this. And then you'd look at your watch and you go, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late to pick up my daughter. And on the way there, you'd suddenly experience this great stress. I don't have gas. So you drop her off and then you'd get pick her up mm -hmm. and then maybe you wouldn't be in line and then you'd have to get gas on the way home and then you'd be late to dance. And all of a sudden this inefficient zigzaggy thing. So the reality is, is that executive function is all about, about making that mental movie in your head. And we call that being a mind mime. And it stands for mimetic ideational information processing, which is a really big mouthful. I'm gonna but, write that down. Right, but basically <laughs> you mime the idea in your head. You oh, pre-experience okay. and you pre-imagine. So if I drop you off at school and you're a teenager, 
you have to not just walk into school and walk into class and say to the teacher, I'm gracing you with my presence. <laughs> you have to go to your locker and pre-imagine, okay, I have calculus first, and I know I've got to turn in that you know problem set. And then after that, I have a free block, and during my free block, I have got to finish off that English, and then I'm heading into my science course, and the lab report is due, so I've got to gather all those things from my locker before I go. The kids that don't do that, they're what we describe a beat behind. And so Mm -hmm. it really requires you to have a mental visual image of what you look like and you have to pre-imagine yourself going from point A to point B. And that's how we do time management. Because if you have this imagination, that sort of thought bubble in your head, and you have an amount of time, you have to figure and see, can I fit all those things in? If I can't, then I'm gonna have to eliminate something or I'm gonna have to increase my pace. So when we look at, quote, disorders and things, right? Mm -hmm. The distance from where you are to how far in the future you can play out that mental movie, um, especially in the world of psychology, is often referred to as the time horizon. We like to call it the temporal spatial window because it's not just across time, it's across spaces. So you really have to imagine yourself moving through space. So the thing about it is when we look at, quote, disorders, It's absolutely been proven that kids with ADHD demonstrate a 30% developmental delay in that. Mm -hmm. So you might have a student who is 16 who's supposed to be able to see three days into the future, but their executive function age is much more like a 13-year-old and they can only see eight hours into the future. So this Mm -hmm. is the kid who gets the homework assignment but then forgets to turn it in the next day. So that can be that kind of ADHD profile. I see. And yeah. you know what? I think one of your great sound bites, that I, sound bites that I use all the time is that students with executive function challenge kind of have two time zones, which yep. is like now and not now. Absolutely. <laughs> the parents love yep. that. So use that school psychologist oh, and yeah. parent means. Because when I say that, they're like, yes, now and not now. I get that. And so kids are like, okay, well, now is the project is not due. And then all of a sudden, you know, so it's not now. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's now. And then they're procrastinating or That's they're working right. like super hard, super late, or they totally forget it altogether because, oh my gosh, suddenly it's now. So do you have a couple of things that, um, you know, ideas for helping kids understand, you know, it's now and not now that like, it's almost now. Yeah. You said mental, <laughs> <laughs> mental yep. imagery. Is that around, um, you know, actually like drawing it out or planners or talking about it? Like how could parents and teachers support kids in right. that? You know, between now and not now, it's almost now. Right. So I think there's sort of four key things. Um, and I often get asked that question. If you only had one piece of advice <laughs> to give to any teenager or any family, what would it be? Um, and we do have a lot of teenagers who absolutely will say, if you say, well, let's take a look at a schedule book. And be clear that a schedule book is different than an agenda book. Because mm-hmm. an agenda is where you write down your homework. But a schedule book is where you actually draft out what your day is going to look like. And it's amazing. Every time I take out a page where we'll draft in 15 minute increments, I have class, I have a free block, then I have to commute home, like you have to schedule in the time for driving places. And Mm -hmm. you have maybe a lacrosse game, but who knows, it might go over, so you have to plan the buffer time. When I show kids that and I say, is this what you thought your day looked like? Every single time they go, (laughs) oh my God, no, like I had no idea this was what my day looked like. Mm -hmm. They tend to think more in the words of, oh, well, I just have school and cross tonight. They don't actually see visually how it's gonna fill up and how the day is gonna kind of roll out. So where you get the pushback from kids on that is they go, I don't like that because if I write down that um, I'm gonna eat dinner at six o'clock and we eat at 6.30, then the whole thing is thrown Mm -hmm. off. So the point that I really make with a lot of high schoolers and especially even it's important as a parent to start teaching that sense of scheduling as early as elementary through middle school is you can't look at it as a rigid schedule but more about where you have blocks of time to be productive and that if you use that time effectively and if you kind of pre-imagine and know what you're going to accomplish in that then you've actually freed your time you've not been jailed by time you've freed up your time to have all this time to do other things that you want which leads to the second thing. Um, as you probably know, one of our favorite strategies is we use analog clocks. Yeah, yes, I love it. I love this and sweep of time concept. Can absolutely. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, unfortunately in this day and age, most kids are driven by digital. Time. Right, I now mean, and not now. No, it's no, four no, o'clock, no, right. it's not four o'clock. <laughs> absolutely, and when you say to a kid, we're um, leaving the house in 20 minutes. You now, nine out of 10 kids get dot, dot, two, oh. Like, the digital. But that's not what you and I do. You and I would say, okay, well, we're leaving the house in 20 minutes. And we Mm -hmm. see that volume 
And it's again, it makes time spatial because if I only have that, you know, 20 minute volume of time, I have to see, well, I've got to go to the bathroom. I have to get my soccer uniform. I need to braid my hair. I need to grab my bag and then I need to out the door. If all you get is I'm leaving in dot two O, then you're not going to get up. It's now and not now. You're not going to get up off the couch and do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So part of what we find is, is if a student can see the daily time and realize, okay, I have an hour block. And then they're seeing that analog clock and figuring out what am I going to fit into that analog clock and regulate time, then all of a sudden you free up your time later in the day. And because kids right now, they're pretty inefficient. I mean, they'll sit down and they might do one problem and then they check Instagram and then they do another problem and they pet the dog. And before you know it, a task that should take 15 minutes is taking an hour. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't feel good to a student. So it's making them make time visible. It's freeing up the working memory and having them really see what their day is going to look like. And it's, it's not just about time management. It's about seeing yourself within a volume of time so that you can get to the things that you want to do and find that balance. Right. And I think kids are also very, and adults too, like pretty inaccurate in their time estimation, how long something will take. Absolutely. So ironically, I mean, teachers and parents are always like, oh, the technology is a distraction, but is there an app for that that they can see like the sweep of time and how long it takes versus, you know, how long I thought it was going to take to help build that? Are you suggesting like literally like get out a clock? Yeah. So, in which is your preferred. Absolutely. So in the younger grades and actually all the way through high school, we really do prefer the real clock um, for a variety of reasons. First of all, when you have an actual clock and you use a dry erase marker and you draw on that clock, mm. it allows you, so for example, if it were 315 and you're drawing and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna work from 315 to 320 to 330 to 340 to 345, and you shade that in, you're going through that visual motor integration of pre-experiencing and kind of feeling mm -hmm. the sweep and passage of time. So it becomes more of a motor piece too, which is important. The next thing is if you've drawn on that clock and let's say that you're going to read um, you know, 10 pages in your textbook, it also allows you to create time markers. So you can say, I'm gonna start on page 10, I need to mm -hmm. be on page 20, which means at three, the, like whatever time I just started, like at the 3.30 mark, I've really got to be five Half pages yeah. in. So if at that midpoint mark, I'm not five pages in, that clock gives you that metacognitive feedback to mm -hmm. self-monitor. Um, and again, if you were to have an image of, all right, I want to be five pages in, and I'm only two pages in, then I either have to modify the plan or I have to modify what I'm doing in front of me. And so it really develops that self-monitoring and metacognition. Um, and we do prefer an actual clock because time is moving and it does allow you to look back to what you shaded and say, well, how was I using mm -hmm. my time? So kids really become reflective about um, you know, their productivity and, and they like that and they'll actually wanna sort of get it done because they realize I don't wanna spend more time. Um, we do have an app called the 360 Thinking Time Tracker app which models a component of that and it has a start point and an end point and a midpoint mm -hmm. check-in. Um, I do think that's really helpful for kids. Yeah, I mean, technology for the older students that kind of makes it a little, freaks up their interest right. level to do that. Um, but for and like little ones, I think that that physical clock, I mean, I bet drawing in it is like super fun. <laughs> it anyway. is, it is. And the other thing is there's, um, I when teachers are doing whole class instruction, we really recommend that through their smart board, they project an analog clock mm. on, the smart, on the board. And then you can write on the board how the class is gonna be spent. So oh, wow. if it's nine o'clock, you can project an analog clock, you can draw right on the whiteboard and say, we're gonna work from nine to 9.15 and you need to write your summary. And from 9.15 to 9.30, you need to draw a picture of your favorite scene. And again, that minute hand is passing so that as the mm -hmm. teacher, you have something to reference in dialogue. Okay, how have you been using that past 10 minutes? Where are you at? And kids really like to reference it because they can see time and you're making it visible. Right, and what you normally see is like we have recess and lunch and right, it's Absolutely. A, it, it kind of fuels that now and not now. It's not recess now. I love that, and this is why exactly I brought Sarah on because that's super practical, and that's something you all school psychologists can recommend. And when you're sitting in pre-referral meetings or intervention meetings um, as a teaching strategy, I think that would help a lot of kids, and not just kids who are sitting there who are at particular challenges with understanding Absolutely. the sweep of time. And it helps a lot with differentiation because 
inevitably you have the kid in class who rushes through their math and they're like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> they all meet and, in like fifth yeah. grade and decide on the playground that yeah. like fast right. is smart. Yeah. <laughs> like you have to like, exactly. <laughs> I don't know what the, a secret meeting and everyone's like, okay guys, <laughs> fast is it. And you're like, no, slow and right is better than fast and Absolutely. wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and then the teacher's like, well, you know, you, you need to do something more. And, and this kid, I mean, typically they're done because they're ready to move on. They want to socialize, they want to play, and they're not always aware that we're still doing math. So mm. when you've shaded mm-hmm. on the clock, even in front of the classroom, it allows us to come back and say, it's great that you're done, but see, we still have that time allocated for math. We're still being mathematicians. Mm. So w- here's what we need to do to continue to do math. And it gives them that visible feedback. Similarly, if you have kids that are really slow processors, where you need to differentiate the instruction, you can make that student feel good about what they can accomplish within a volume of time and not have an unrealistic expectation. So I think that's useful for those kids too. Well, speaking of sweep of time, I know you have to go to a presentation, (laughs) which is really (laughs) exciting, a whole day thing. I could talk to you for like 62 hours about executive functioning and really like nerd out on it because I just really love learning more about how to support students. And I know you all, as school psychologists, this is something that is really critical because, you know, a lot of different challenges and even kids with just typical development have um, need support in executive functioning. So where can people go to learn more about some of these great strategies and ways that they can, you know, see your work? You bet. So um, our website is EF practice, like executive function. Um, and certainly myself and my coworker, we do lots of presentations. You can check out our updated calendar and we have some webinars that are always kind of coming up and out. Um, I do a lot of presentations here in the California area as well. Right. Um, and then our, we also on our website have a lot of products. So we have um, a couple of new things. We have an academic agenda book for about fifth grade through college. Um, and then we just, it just came out last week, we adapted that. We have now have an elementary planner and oh. we also have a planner for adults because we had so many parents and adults who said, we love this, but you know, I don't have homework, I have to do. So we adapted it so that you know, adults can use this really effectively too. Um, and we have all sorts of, um, we have something called the Time Tracker Program, which is around students um, being able to utilize an, utilize an analog clock and use time markers to track their time as well. Okay, say the yep. website one more time yep. for everybody. So it's EF practice.com efpractice.com well thank you so much Sarah oh, Ward, for coming thanks for um, having me sorry I didn't bring you coffee that was a faux pas on my part but I'm really all glad good. to have you <laughs> I will take thank you me. out for coffee and enjoy Love your it. presentation and thanks so much for yeah. all that you do for our kiddos with uh, two time zones now and not now and helping <laughs> them find that middle now time so that's been really fantastic to have you that's great thank you so much thank you yeah. Yeah.